Hmm, hey everyone, what are you looking at? Oh, it's this point. You're still looking at this point. And you're still looking at this point. <laughs> so I have made a custom PCG blueprint that makes all of the points rotate to face a position in the world. And I've defined that position in the world by a vector on the blueprint that the PCG graph lives in, which then passes the vector into the PCG graph. I had the idea for this node when I was spawning tables with chairs around them, and I couldn't figure out how to make the chairs face the table using existing PCG nodes. I have tried to set rotators, and they just don't work as I expect. So if you know how to set rotators, please let me know and make this entire video irrelevant. I would love that. <laughs> Anyways, here's how you set this up. First step, I'm going to create a blueprint where everything will live inside. Just create that as an actor and drag it into the world. Now within the blueprint itself, I'm going to add a spline, and this is going to be the borders for the uh, PCG graph that I'm spawning. I'm going to just make it a closed loop to start off with, and hold Alt to drag a point off, hold Alt to drag another point off, and that was the wrong axis, let me try that again. Doing a little setup on the spline now, moving the points apart, so when I drag it into the world, I don't have to do this every single time I instantiate it. Next, I'm going to add the PCG element, and for that, I need the PCG graph created, so I'm going to create that right now. PCG underscore rotate towards, and now I can go back into the blueprint and set the blueprint graph to this new PCG graph I've created. There we go. Next, I need the point that I'm going to have everything face. So I'll create that as a variable. It's going to be a vector. And I'll call it look point. Click the eye icon to make it instance editable. And now I can click show 3D widget. If you can't click it, then you probably forgot to make it instance editable. And this gives me something that I can click on and drag around now. All right, this blueprint needs one more thing. The point right here is a local position relative to the blueprint, but the PCG graph is going to need a point that is in world space. So back in the blueprint, add another vector for the world location. I'm just going to call it world look point, and remember that name, I'm going to be using it a lot later. In the construction script, I can set world look point. Since look point is currently relative to the blueprint position, I just have to add the world position of the blueprint to look point, and then I have a world position. I'll just use the get actor location node to get me the blueprint position. Plug both look point and the actor location into an addition node, and plug those both into the set world point node. And now if I zero out look point, you can see that the world look point is the same as the blueprint position. So now I'm done with the blueprint, I'll hide world look point because I don't need to ever directly set that. Compile and save. All right, and now I can set up the PCG graph. I'm going to just do a uh, very basic setup for this thing. I'll get the spline data. You can leave the spline data node filtered to self because both the spline and the PCG graph are living in the same blueprint. The spline sampler I'm setting up to distance on interior. I'll just leave it at 100 by 100. And now I'll do a projection node just so that everything conforms to the landscape. I'll use landscape height because I'm going to be setting the rotation myself later. And now here is where I would spawn the rotation blueprint, but I don't have it created yet, so I'm just going to uh, spawn a static mesh. So I'll drop in a self-pruning node to make sure points aren't too close, and then a static mesh spawner. And now I'll create a mesh entry, and I'll just use a chair because chair, the chair mesh shows you know, where it's looking really well. And let me add a few more of these. I'll just expand the spline. So now they're all facing in a single direction, and you can see they're refreshing when I move the point, but they're not turning. So let me add the rotation now. For that, I need a PCG blueprint. So I'm going to create a new blueprint element. PCG blueprint element is the object that I want. Add that and I'll call it bpcg underscore rotate towards because I am very creative with my naming conventions. All right, now I can just spawn this blueprint by uh, adding an execute blueprint node and searching for the blueprint element type. 
pcg underscore rotate towards. I'll hook it up, and now things are looking a little messy, so I'll select all nodes and press Q to line them up. So I need to add the vector in the PCG blueprint, and I need to make the blueprint accept it, but as you can see, this only takes override and seed right now. So back in the PCG blueprint, I'm going to create a new variable. It's going to be a vector3, and I'll give it the same name that I gave it in the blueprint, which I said you should remember, but I've forgotten, so let me check that. That's right, it's world look point. So I'll set this vector to the same name, world look point, and I'll expose it so it becomes an input on the node. Expose it, compile, save, and now I see world look point here. So now I can use a get actor property node to pull the world look point from the blueprint. I will set the property name to world look point and the output attribute name to world look point so that I can output it into the PCG blueprint. Just like the get spline data, the actor filter is going to be self. And now this value is uh, flowing through into the Blueprint node. Now in the PCG Blueprint, we're going to override a function, that is execute with context. I'm going to do a basic setup on the execute with context function. I'm setting context to a local variable because I'm going to use it at a lot of points in this setup. And then I'm getting the input from the execute with context node, and that input is the uh, graph that I've connected into this node. So it contains point data. Now I'm going to use a for each loop to look through the input array. So if I uh, hook up multiple different points to this node, it's going to look through them all. Each array element is a PCG tagged data. I'm going to break that so that I can access the data. And then I want to make sure that the data type is PCG spatial data. If it's not, then I just want to return. I don't want to do anything with the data. If it is, then I want to convert it over to point data. And I'm going to drop the context in here. And then once I know that it's point data, I can send it through the point loop. After the point loop, I'm basically going to reverse the steps. So I'll make PCG tagged data. I'll make that data into an array. I'll convert the array into a PCG data collection, and that I can output. I just have to hook the output up to a return node, and I'm done with the execute with context. And I neglected to connect the context up there, so let me do that now. So I watched a video from Unreality Bytes recently where he described this process as unpacking and then repacking the data, and that seems like a useful way to think about it. If you want to watch that video, I'll drop a link to it in the description. I recommend you check out all of his PCG content. He does a great job of explaining things, and you will learn a lot. And now I'm adding another override for the point loop body. Check return value on the return node to make sure you're sending out data, and then I can connect the in point to the out point and verify that everything is working. Compile and save, and let's see the results. Inspect and select the piece of graph as the debug object, and there the points are. So you can see here that the rotation is set to zero everywhere, which is why everything was facing a single direction. So to fix that, I'm going to break this PCG point. And now I can select the point values I care about. In this case, it's just transform, so I'll uncheck everything else. Now I'll break the transform, and that gives me access to the rotation. I'll break the rotator. And now I have all of the current rotations as floats. So I need to find the lookout rotation, and then I will rebuild everything. To do that, I'll use a find lookout rotation node, which takes two vectors as an input. For the start, I will use the current transform location, and for the target, I'll use the world look point variable, and that will give me a rotator for each point that points at the world look point. Now I need to rebuild the rotator. I'll keep the roll and pitch from the existing transform because I don't want this tipping, and I'll use the yaw from the find lookout rotation. Now I'll rebuild the transform. I'll keep the original values for location and scale, and plug in this new rotator. And now I'm going to set members in PCG point, which will allow me to write to the point. Check transform to expose transform as a pin. Plug the transform in there. And just hook up the struct ref to the in point on the point loop body node. And that's 
everything I need from this node. We can see that the rotation Z is being set, and the chairs are rotating. And if I move the point, the chairs will rotate to face it. Now I'll show you how to fix one issue that you might run into. If your static meshes don't have the same rotation as each other, like this Roman statue, it is 90 degrees off. So if I look in closer, you can see that they are facing to the right of where they should be facing. So if I rotate them 90 degrees to the left, that'll fix this problem. To do that, I can add in a transform points node and set it to negative uh, 90, negative 90 on the z-axis. And there we go, that's fixed it for these. And if you're just using a bunch of meshes that all have the same rotation, that's fine. But if you're not, and let me demonstrate here by uh, adding the chairs back in, if you're not, then one mesh or the other is going to be rotated incorrectly. So the way I handle this is to spawn the meshes using separate static mesh spawner nodes. So I want this transform points to only work on the statue. So the way I can do this is with a point filter and a density noise node. Using the two of those, I can reproduce the weight that you can select in the static mesh spawner node. The density noise node sets density to a random number between 0 and 1. So if I filter density at 0.5, that means I'm going to be filtering the points in half, because half of them are going to be over 0.5, and half of them are going to be under 0.5. And if I update one of them to weight 3, I should change the point filter to 0.75. Make sure you keep track of whether you should use the inside or the outside filter for each static mesh. So since I've selected the 0.75, I want the one with the weight 3 to go on the outside filter, and the one with weight 1 will go on the inside filter. And now I can just remove them from each one, because I have replace the weights with this point filter. All right, so now I have split the spawners and randomized the spawns. And the transform is still on the Roman statue. And there we go. Everything is uh, rotated in the proper direction, and they all face the point as it moves around. Hey, I'm back again at the end of the video, and I just learned something new about uh, how the point data flows through the PCG graph. So, to demonstrate, I'm going to cut these points in half so I can work with both halves of points, and I'll do that using a point filter. I'm going to grab the X location here, and in the PCG graph, let me drag this over a little bit, and I'm going to add a point filter node greater than position x. Use constant threshold and make it greater than this value from the blueprint. And I'll drag this point filter in. And now if I connect this up, you see that I've got half the points here on the inside filter. And I've got half the points here on the outside filter. But if I drag them together, we only see the results of the outside filter. And that's because both of these points are flowing through, and in the blueprint, we're actually looking at both of these points because of the for each loop. But because it creates an array every time it goes through the for each loop, only the final array that gets created goes out through the return node and is accessible by the next point in the PCG graph. So instead of this make array and make PCG data collection, what I want to do is I'll promote this to a local variable. I'll call it PCG tagged data array. And now I'll, instead of make array at this point, I will add to the array. Add right here, hook up the array, and then I'll replace this return node with this add node. So now I've got a blank array to start with, and every time I run through the for each loop, I am outputting the results of the point loop into this array. So it is going to cumulatively add up all the points. Now once the for each loop is completed, I know my array is going to have all its values, so I will hook up the return node with the array as the output to the completed step of the for each loop. Compile, save, and all the points are back.
There is another problem that you may run into when you send multiple different points into a single node. So let me show you that problem and how to fix it. If I take a look at the points right here and inspect, you can see that I've got 70 points. And on the other side of things, the self-proning node has six points. And if I inspect the rotate towards, it shows 26 points. So what's happening is that two independent sets of points are being input into the self-pruning node, and it's working on both of them, but it's not combining them. So points between the two can actually overlap, like right here. So at some point when you're doing this, after you've put multiple independent points into a single point, you're going to want to add a union node, and a union node is going to combine all the different point data into a single set of points that then the future nodes are going to all look at. Okay, so now that I've put the union node in, there we go, everything looks good. If I inspect this self-pruning node instead of the six points we saw, we're seeing 11. So it's combined all the points with the union node right here, 70 points, even though this output only shows 35 points. And that's it. Thanks again for watching, and if you do know anything about making rotators in PCG, please let me know.